Welcome everyone, uh, both uh, in person here in the room and, and online. It's a great pleasure to have you here for our 3CL seminar on, on the cleaning of corporate governance. Now, when I read the title, I thought that some Cambridge lecturers start their lectures by saying, first, we've got some housekeeping to do, and then we move on to content. Now, when I read your title, uh, Jens, then I thought, oh, this is all about housekeeping. And you've got very good reasons to do so. And we are very happy to have you here as a speaker today, Jens. Uh, Jens is a visiting professor at the uh, University of uh, Washington University in St. Louis School of Law. And his research and teaching interests lie at the intersection of business law, contract law, and comparative law. The particular focus of uh, his research, as we'll see today, is on the use of large amounts of texts and other forms of big data. Before coming to Washington University, he was a postdoc at the Milstein Center for, for Global Markets and Corporate Ownership. Jens, we're very happy to have you here today. The floor uh, and the house is over to you to be uh, clean. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Felix, for the kind introduction. Thank you all for having me. I can't see you now, but I understand that later on we'll have a bit of a chance to engage in, uh, in, in a Q&A and in some interaction. Um, this is a great opportunity to present this project, I'm, which I'm super excited about, and which, although this paper that I'm presenting today um, has just been published in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review, is still going on. We will talk later about what we're doing at the moment. As you not, might know from the paper, this is joint work with Kathy Wang at Virginia, Aaron Lilly at Wisconsin, and Eric Talley, who is my former supervisor at the Milstein Center uh, at Columbia University. Before I get started for real, just a brief overview of what this paper is about. By now, as you have attended this, uh, as, I, as I guess you have attended this, uh, this lecture series for a while, you probably know that most papers in law and economics focus on one question, either empirical or normative, and try to answer this question using either some theoretical models or some empirical evidence. This paper is slightly different. In this paper, we unveil a new resource, the CCG database that, or at least that's what we really hope, will help put some important parts of the empirical corporate governance literature on a new and more solid footing. In essence, the paper tells the interconnected stories. Just to avoid any confusion, I'm not just retelling the paper here, I'm giving you my take on what the most important threats in the paper are. The first story is about how large parts of the existing empirical corporate governance literature have for years relied on data whose accuracy nobody ever bothered to verify. This is although there were at least some pretty stark warning signs that should have alerted researchers of the possibility that something might be up. Using our new database, we show that the existing data suffered from severe inaccuracies. We also provide some preliminary evidence that some of the most iconic results in empirical corporate governance might not hold if more accurate information is substituted for the faulty data used before. The second story is about how we got there in the first place and what we can do to avoid similar problems in the future. We think that there are two main culprits for the situation. First, although much of the information about public companies corporate governance regimes is supposed to be in the public domain, a variety of actors, among them the state secretaries of states in the US have erected substantial barriers to accessing it. And second, lawyers who should be best suited to assess corporate governance regimes do not seem to have played a major role in putting together the data sets used by empirical corporate governance researchers. We also talk about what we did to avoid similar problems with our data set. The third story is more forward-looking. One important innovation of the CCG data set is that it makes the raw corporate governance documents that we use to build the data set available to the public in a structured and, well, hopefully easily accessible form. This is not only important because it makes it way easier for others to validate the variables in our data set. It also allows corporate governance researchers for the first time to investigate corporate governance regimes using natural language processing and computational methods. Okay, so let me get started with story number one. This is going to be the focus of my presentation today, and I'm briefly going to talk about the other two threats as well. 
One fundamental question in corporate law revolves around how best to structure the relationship between the shareholders um, of a company and its board of directors to make sure that corporations act in the interests of all their stakeholders. Some maintain that it's best to give shareholders strong control rights because as the story goes, the management will otherwise, otherwise use the corporation's assets to further their own interests. Others think that the idea that we can find solutions that will work for all companies is a myth. For this reason, the state should refrain from meddling too much in corporate affairs. This is because laws are necessarily one size fits all solutions and corporations might work better if they are allowed to adopt whichever corporate governance regime best suits their need. In practice, this camp mostly advocates against mandatory rules that protect shareholders. This camp seems to have lost some, uh, some steam in recent years. But there, um, there is a third camp that, um, that, uh, that arrives at similar conclusions. This camp starts from a different intellectual vantage point though. This camp thinks that corporations work better if the board is isolated from too much shareholder pressure because some shareholders mostly act out of short-term short -term considerations or because too much focus on shareholder value maximization means that the board will treat other, share, uh, other stakeholders badly. In practice, this camp, as I said, like often arrives at solutions that are very similar to those advocated by the second camp, but their intellectual underpinning is somewhat different. Importantly, as most of you are aware, this is not just a theoretical question, but one with important implications for corporate law. In the US, when Delaware courts decide whether to allow boards to adopt new versions of anti-activist poison pills, they are essentially negotiating a version of this question. When the SEC, um, the security markets regulator in the US, deliberates about whether to, uh, uh, to take another attempt at mandating proxy access, it is essentially negotiating a version of this question as well. So let's brainstorm a bit. How can one make an informed decision about what is right or wrong here? Theoretical considerations only lead so far. If one thinks that stakeholders act mostly rational, um, uh, shareholders act mostly rational, but need the state's help in keeping the management in line, one will arrive at the pro-shareholder position, the left side of the titter tatter that I showed you before. If one thinks that shareholders' decisions do not always lead to optimal outcomes, for, for example, because some of them, for example, activist hedge funds, only have their short-term interests in mind, one will probably side with the pro-management camp. Theory alone does not really help us decide what is right or wrong here. This is probably one reason why this debate has long been influenced by empirical research in law and finance. It is possible to differentiate between different streams of research. One stream of research tries to answer the question whether individual corporate governance devices, such as staggered boards, are associated with better outcomes. This is not the main focus of this paper. Instead, this paper focuses on a second stream of literature that tries to measure associations quantitative associations between outcomes and shareholder-friendly versus board-friendly corporate governance regimes more generally. Now, to do this type of research, financial economists had to put together data sets that purported to quantify legal institutions. They did so first at the country level and later at the company level. These papers have been tremendously influential. They are among the most cited papers in peer-reviewed economics and finance journals with several, several thousand sites for the most prominent, uh, prominent among them. As an example, consider the third paper featured in the list, the one down there. This is a paper published in 2003 by Paul Gompers and his co-authors. This paper introduced a corporate governance index called the G-Index that assigned a numerical score to companies based on how many management-friendly corporate governance devices this company had adopted. The paper then went on to prove two different conjectures. First, 
that corporations that had a very shareholder friendly corporate governance model had a higher value as measured by a measure called Tobin's Q. It's really a simple version of Tobin's Q. I will briefly talk about that later. Second, and in a way like more interesting to many people in the field, they document, documented that these companies also showed higher return on investments than companies with very management friendly uh, governance regimes. What does that mean? Basically, they calculated that investors who invested in the former companies, shareholder friendly companies, while at the same time betting against the share price of companies with management friendly corporate governance regimes, that they could have greatly outperformed the market in terms of the returns they would have taken home. Now, of course, this finding, actually like both findings, provide pretty strong support for the hypothesis that shareholder-friendly corporate governance models can make sense, at least under some circumstances. At the same time, researchers have always been somewhat queasy about this result, and in particular, the second one. Now, there are various reasons for people's queasiness. For one, the second result that investing in pro-shareholder companies was a way for investors to make money did not hold for years after 2000. While some argued that this was because investors just learned to price in differences in corporate governance regimes. So after 2000, they paid more for, the stay, uh, for shares in shareholder-friendly companies in the first place, reducing the returns, uh, the returns they took home. Um, the fact that the result went away after 2000 also points to the possibility that, that they might have been a fluke from the start. With regard to the first result, um, the association between, um, between shareholder-friendly corporate governance regimes and company value, researchers at UC Berkeley have made the case that the measure for firm value used in studies like that is a poor choice and show for a study that tweaks the original Gompers et al. results, that the results do not hold when one uses alternative measures for firm value. Finally, what we focus on here, there was always the issue of data validity. The G index, the measure for the shareholder friendliness of a, uh, of a corporation's corporate governance regime, consisted of 24 different items that purportedly captured whether a firm had adopted a particular management-friendly corporate governance device or not. For example, one question was, did a company have a staggered board? And second, did it shield its directors from liability by means of a so-called 102B7 waiver, which is basically uh, a charter provision in a Delaware company's charter that makes it impossible for shareholders to go after directors for certain breaches of the duty of care. Gompers et al. had not gathered this information themselves, but they had obtained it from the Nonprofit Investor Responsibility Research Center, IRC. The IRC itself did not share a lot of information on how the data was gathered. Supposedly, the data came from corporations' corporate governance documents, charters, bylaws, board resolutions. But we don't know how it had been gathered and by whom. And in particular, we don't know whether there were any lawyers involved in the data gathering effort. We also don't know whether the IRC implemented any checks to ensure intercode of reliability or not. Not only was there not a lot of documentation on how the IRC data was put together, some of the data must have seem, seemed suspicious to researchers from the start. This graph shows the prevalence of so-called 102B7 waivers as reported by the IRC data set. Um, I've said this before, um, just for, for those of you who are not um, experts in American uh, corporate law, which I expect like there are a few in the audience. Um, Section 102B7 uh, of the Delaware General Corporation Law was adopted in response to a decision by the Delaware Supreme Court in the mid 1980s that held board members liable for not being diligent enough in negotiating a deal for the sale of the company. Now, this decision created a huge backlash. Rates for DNO insurances were, uh, were soaring, and generally, like people thought that this was not a great decision by the Delaware court. Now, in response to this decision, the Delaware legislator um, essentially granted companies a way to change their liability regime 
um, and make it impossible for courts to hold directors liable under similar circumstances. Um, after Delaware did so, other legislators in the US, in the US, um, most corporate law is state law. So basically, um, there are 50 uh, or more different corporate law regimes in the US. Um, so other, other legislators after Delaware had, uh, um, had taken this course followed suit. Um, and today, if you talk to people in the field, um, they will basically tell you that um, almost every publicly traded company adopted one of these waivers. Now look at the information reported by, by the IRC data set. For the early 1990s, the data set reports that almost every company had such a waiver, but then their prevalence dropped markedly. This drop runs completely counter to common wisdom about these waivers. If anything, we should expect their prevalence to increase over time as companies with more antiquated governance regimes fall out of the data set and newers enter, or if companies that had just like never bothered to change their charter finally got to doing so after all. Nevertheless, despite these, um, these issues, the IRSC data became the go-to um, data set for academics interested in investigating relationships between companies' corporate governance regimes and outcomes. Others use the same data to create different indices that they deem more important. One example um, is Bepchak using Bepchak at Harvard at Al's entrenchment in index or E index, which, which essentially consists of a subset of the features that together form the G index. Even those who tried to show Gompers and similar papers wrong ultimately did so using the same data to power their studies. As a result, today, a considerable part of the empirical corporate governance literature is built on data that we know includes some problematic coding errors. But we do, what we do not know is whether these errors are just exceptions or whether the data is just fundamentally flawed. Okay, so what do we do to evaluate the accuracy of this data set and the G-index? We start by collecting, cleaning, and organizing the full digital charter histories of all companies that were included in the IRRC data set or that were included in the S&P 1500 at some point in the 2000s. For those of you who haven't heard about that before, the S&P 1500 is an important index, including the biggest 1500 companies listed on stock exchanges in the United States. We also employed a large group of research assistants to help us hand label a large subset of these charters for relevant corporate governance features. Using these labels, we set out to correct the G-index. This might seem relatively straightforward, but it is not. The reason why it is not easy to recreate the G-index is that a company's corporate governance regime in the US can only be determined by looking at its charter, bylaws, board resolutions, and background state laws together. In some way, the state law is the starting point for determining whether a company has a certain corporate governance feature or not. The law will likely stipulate some default rule together with rules that determine whether and how a corporation can deviate from, the, from, the, from this default, which will sometimes require a clause in the charter, sometimes one in bylaws, and sometimes a mere board resolution is enough. Now, I mentioned before that we only collect the chartering histories, but at this point, do not have the same data available for corporations bylaws. How can we still replicate the constituents that together uh, form, the, uh, form the G index? The approach we take in our paper is to rely on the G index in all instances, in, except in those where we can prove that it is wrong because we know that the background state law together with the chartering information that we have does not allow for, a, uh, for, a, for an outcome that is in line with what the IRC data set reports. In other words, what we do is take a conservative approach at, uh, to correcting the G index. So how does the IRC information fare? This graph compares the rate of 102B7 waivers in the IRC data set, what I talked about before, and in our own data. What you see here is what we suspected earlier is actually true. The true prevalence of these waivers increase over time and reaches somewhere around 80 to 90%, much more in line with common assumptions. 
This also means that the IRC database gets it wrong a substantial number of times. When we aggregate all the information for the different, for the 24 factors, the picture is even more bleak. The G index is off for around 80% of all observations in the data set. The divergence varies widely. For some companies, the G index overreports the adoption of management friendly corporate governance uh, devices. For most companies, however, the G index is too low. What this data also allows us to do is to test whether the results in Gompers at all whole when we substitute our own data for the original IRSC data. You will remember from our previous discussions that Gompers et al. reported various results, including that an investment strategy that invested in shareholder-friendly corporations while betting against the share price of management-friendly corporations yielded pretty high results. Now, we replicate this analysis using our own data. Now, remember again that our approach to correcting the G-index is pretty conservative and accepts the information reported in the G-index unless we know that the index is off. Still, we find that the results attenuate considerably when we do that. You can see that in the last line um, in this table, which reports the annual excess returns for calculations using different versions of the data set. We first replicate Gompers et al. to make sure we, go, we get the calculations right. This is what you see in the second column. We then go on to use different versions of our corrected data. What you see is that the returns drop considerably. Of course, this result also don't, doesn't completely, uh, the, the results don't, also don't completely go away. So what should you make of this result? Well, if here comes, here comes, here comes a key point. If the, if the errors in the G index would have been just noise, you would expect the results to become stronger if the, uh, if the data is corrected, not weaker. And as we only correct parts of the information here, it might well be that a replication using a fully revised G index might see the results go away, complete, uh, go away completely. Um, what explains this result? It's kind of hard to say. Maybe there were systematic differences in how companies from different industries were coded, meaning that the G index picked up on something else. If you want my personal opinion, I think that this result just suggests that the results in Gompers et al. might have been the result of extensive data mining. Gompers et al. sliced up the data set in, uh, in a way that ultimately did not seem super intuitive to me. Maybe, but this is just my personal conjecture, I can't prove that. Maybe they just played around with the data long enough for them to find results. That's like, if you do empirical research, you know that that's not something completely unusual to do um, and that it's hard to like not be just convinced when you see the, uh, the results you want to see that this, this, this is the, uh, the analysis you should have run just from the start. Okay, so we have shown that the results in Gompers et al. might not hold. What is next? Um, first, at this moment, we work on gathering information from bylaws, which will allow us to do a more full correction of the, uh, of the G index and then rerun our analysis to see whether the results attenuate even further if we substitute more accurate information for the old, uh, for the old data. Um, I said this, uh, I just said this, we plan to replicate most, uh, all, um, in addition to like replicating the Gomper study again, we also plan to replicate more studies like Gomper et al to see whether it's just Gomper that's affected or whether some other study, whether results in some other studies will go away as well. Okay, let me briefly turn to the second thread in our paper. How did we arrive at this sorry state of affairs and what do we, do to make, uh, to make sure that our data doesn't suffer from similar problems. We identified two main culprits for the situation where, as you remember, Gompers et al, who themselves were not lawyers, but financial economists, used information gathered by a third party. This is partly because lawyers never bothered to contribute to the task of assembling large data sets that will allow research to run large scale studies comparing the corporate governance regimes of individual firms. Um, now, we identified two main culprits for the situation we're in. Um, uh, so, sorry, I've just, I've just said this. Um, the, second, the second problem is data availability. While in principle, corporate governance documents, at least those of publicly traded firms, should be publicly available, the reality on the ground looks a lot more complicated. Um, what do we do to improve data validity? 
Um, first, we made sure that lawyers code the data. Our data set was coded by RA straight and supervised by us. We also implement extensive quality controls. We double assign coding tasks and monitor ARA performance and made sure that as long as an RA was not completely reliable, they would always be double assigned and um, divergencies between two codings were resolved by, uh, by senior RAs. And finally, um, which I think is the most important step we take to ensure that our data will, at least in the long run, be of superior quality. We make the corpus and the data set publicly available and ask everybody who's using them to look out for errors. And if they find any errors, to report them to us so that we can improve the quality um, of the data set. Um, I also wanted to talk about the last thread in the paper, introducing corporate governance uh, to computational methods, but I think we're already running out of uh, time. So in the interest of allowing for more extensive q and I will skip this for now. But of course, if you have questions about that part, I'm happy uh, to talk about that. And if you want me to give you an overview, I'm also happy to do that in response to one of the, uh, one of the questions. Um, that's all I have for now. Um, I wanna stop here for a moment and see um, whether there are any questions about any of the stuff that I presented so far. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jens.